For the first time, a court was told a former soldier was paid thousands to plan and carry out the murder of Rebels boss Nick Martin. Did the shocking murder of Nick Martin reveal more than just a gang rivalry? The high-profile killing of Martin, a key figure in the motorcycle scene, shook both the underworld and law enforcement. Initially, his public execution was intended as a bold statement to rival gangs, a show of dominance. But as investigators unraveled the plot, they discovered a flawed plan tainted by internal betrayals and miscalculations. The investigation uncovered a tangled web of deceit involving multiple individuals, each with unique motives. In a twist, the sniper, an ex-soldier, avoided a life sentence by agreeing to testify against the suspected mastermind. As the fallout continues, Martin's murder highlights gang culture's loyalty, betrayal, and precarious power dynamics. Let's delve deeper. The assassin who struck a deal. The sniper-style assassination of notorious Perth bikey Nick Martin at the Perth Motorplex sent shockwaves through both the public and law enforcement. The man behind the trigger, a 35-year-old former soldier, managed to remain anonymous for a long time. He meticulously planned the December attack, driven by the lure of a $100,000 payout. However, a dramatic twist unfolded in court as he avoided a life sentence by agreeing to testify against the alleged mastermind behind the hit, David Pye, a rival bikey leader accused of orchestrating the murder. As the court proceedings progressed, the complexities of the case deepened. It emerged that, in addition to the payment for Martin's killing, the former soldier had been offered an astonishing $800,000 to eliminate another bikey overseas, a mission he ultimately declined. Prosecutors weighed his cooperation heavily, as his willingness to expose the players involved in this underworld intrigue was pivotal to the case. Justice Stephen Hall recognized this exceptional cooperation and sentenced him to 20 years in prison, a controversial decision that sparked intense debate among legal experts and the public alike. The implications of this case pull back the curtain on the dark and dangerous world of motorcycle gangs, where power struggles, betrayal, and large sums of money often drive members to extremes. In this high-stakes environment, loyalty can be a fleeting concept, and individuals often find themselves trapped in a web of criminal intrigue that threatens their lives. The former soldier's testimony is expected to unravel a deeper network of rivalries and secret dealings, transforming the high-profile murder into a pivotal moment in exposing the broader criminal landscape. As the investigation unfolds, Martin's murder and the assassin's deal invite us to question the fragile codes of loyalty that govern an increasingly volatile underworld. This case serves as a reminder that even those who seem invulnerable can fall prey to the dark machinations of organized crime. The former soldier, despite his military background and training, found himself ensnared in a world where survival often hinges on making perilous choices. While he may have secured a lighter sentence, the weight of his actions and the decisions that led him down this path linger in the background. The emotional fallout from the assassination reverberates through Martin's family, who continue to grapple with their loss. The impact of violence on innocent lives underscores the consequences of gang rivalries that reach far beyond the individuals directly involved. The question now looms, how much will the former soldier's cooperation reveal about the inner workings of these criminal networks? As he prepares to testify, the stakes grow higher, not just for him, but for everyone involved. With rivalries intensifying and loyalty shifting, this case promises to unearth more than just the details of one assassination. It will expose the very fabric of the criminal underbelly that fuels such violence. Justice Hall's decision has ignited discussions about the ethics of cooperation in the justice system. Many argue that the former soldier's willingness to betray his accomplices should not diminish the severity of his crime. Others contend that his cooperation could lead to significant breakthroughs in dismantling organized crime networks potentially saving lives in the long run. Martin followed amid plan for murder. At the bustling Perth Motorplex, with over 2,000 spectators in attendance, Nick Martin, a well-known figure in the motorcycle community, watched the event alongside his wife, stepdaughter, and her partner. When an incident occurred that shocked the crowd, Martin's life ended in an instant, leaving his stepdaughter's partner injured by the same act. Court revelations unveiled a premeditated plot, orchestrated by a former soldier who had begun communication with David Pye, a senior Comanchero's gang member, in early 2020.
Pai and Martin had a tense history, having both been affiliated with the Rebels Motorcycle Club before Pai switched to the Comancheros. Their relationship had soured to the point of open hostility, with Pai claiming Martin had targeted him previously. This tension ultimately led to a plan for retaliation. The individual responsible for the attack had an unexpected background. He was associated with a group called Shadows of Hope, which branded itself as the world's most fearless charity. The court heard that he discussed his military experience with Pai, presenting himself as a skilled operative. Offered an initial $10,000 for planning, he began an intense surveillance effort, using a drone for reconnaissance on Martin's residence and tracking his movements in person. He even visited the motorplex just weeks before the incident, observing Martin from a close distance. The arrangement was to be worth $150,000 with an advance payment. However, despite the agreement, he only received $40,000 up front. This case highlights the web of complex alliances, betrayals, and tensions in gang dynamics, underscoring how quickly alliances can shift in these high-stakes communities. As the trial progresses, it sheds light on the deeper, often hidden conflicts that characterize this world, offering insights into the challenges of loyalty and rivalry within motorcycle clubs, shooting practice before a single kill shot, State Prosecutor Justin Wally, SC, detailed the extensive preparations behind the plan targeting Nick Martin. Prior to the incident, the man returned to the motorplex late one night when it was closed, making adjustments by removing an aluminum ramp that interfered with his line of sight to ensure the setup was flawless. Afterward, he went to a remote, isolated area to hone his skills, firing 200 rounds at a small target. This practice, according to Wally, was done to collect data and fine-tune his accuracy. On December 12th, the day of the incident, he arrived at the motorplex in the early hours and watched from afar as Martin took his regular seat on the terrace, assessing the situation one last time. Later, he left to put on camouflage gear, returned to the venue, and quietly crawled through a hole in the fence that he had prepared days earlier. From his pre-planned position, he used his equipment to watch his target for 10 to 15 minutes before making his move. The single act had a profound impact, with Martin initially calling out, I've been hit. He was taken to the hospital, where he later passed. Days after the event, the man attempted to collect the rest of his payment, an outstanding $100,000. However, he received only half of it, $50,000. When he questioned Pi, the alleged organizer, about the shortage, he was met with an indifferent response. It is what it is. This exchange highlights not only the challenges and complexities in this network, but also the unpredictability of loyalty within such operations. The case continues to unveil the intricacies and hidden dynamics that define these high-stakes interactions. More than $300,000 paid for second killing. In court, Prosecutor Justin Wally revealed the ongoing connection between the man responsible for Nick Martin's death and David Pye, a senior gang member. Their communication intensified, and just two months after Martin's death, Pye suggested a new target, an overseas rival. Noting that people were impressed by the previous incident, Pye initially offered $800,000 for the task, but due to recent police drug seizures, later revised the offer to $600,000. The man did not commit to this assignment, but accepted an initial payment of $145,000, followed by another $200,000 in cash. To keep the funds hidden, he buried some in PVC piping within Bushland and Warnbro. Their discussions and exchanges continued, with Pi requesting updates. In response, the man sent Pi a video claiming to be rehearsing for the prospective job. However, this preparation proved short-lived. Within weeks, authorities arrested the man, charging him with both Martin's murder and injuring his stepdaughter's partner. Further charges included two counts of dealing in the proceeds of crime, for which he pleaded guilty earlier this year, alongside the murder charge. This sequence of events unveils not just a web of crime, but also the inherent risks, betrayals, and shifting loyalties within such high-stakes worlds. The payment negotiations and the hidden money add intrigue, showing how deeply planned and intricate such networks can be. As the case unfolds, it highlights the tenuous nature of alliances and the lengths individuals go to secure power and evade detection within the criminal landscape. Sniper, now a target. The former soldier's barrister, Simon Freitag S.C., argued in court that his client's cooperation was so significant 
it warranted a sentence below the usual life term for murder. Freytag emphasized that the 35-year-old man's decision to testify against powerful figures in the criminal world, including David Pye, had effectively placed a target on his back for the rest of his life. Due to the dangers linked to his cooperation, the man has been held in protective custody at Casuarina Maximum Security Prison, isolated from other inmates to ensure his safety. In court, Freytag shared that his client deeply regrets his actions, acknowledging that while meticulous preparation, including a practice session firing 200 rounds, had given him confidence, he now feels remorse. Justice Stephen Hall noted that the former soldier has since taken full responsibility for his actions, expressing regret that has persisted ever since he pulled the trigger. The court also heard that the man had not even needed the financial reward. He now feels profound shame for being used in a plan to settle someone else's vendetta. His role as a tool for revenge weighs heavily on him. This case paints a portrait of a man who, despite his skills and strategic planning, was ultimately drawn into a world of shifting loyalties and hidden motives. His cooperation with authorities now comes at a personal cost, forcing him into a life of heightened security and constant vigilance. The regret he expressed in court adds a human layer to the story, showing the personal toll that involvement in organized crime takes, even for those who once thought themselves untouchable and unlawful public execution. Justice Stephen Hall highlighted the carefully planned nature of the former soldier's crime, noting that the meticulous preparations he undertook included reconnaissance on his target, Nick Martin. In court, Justice Hall remarked, There is no doubt this was a contract killing, explaining that the sole motive was financial gain. A contract killing is, in effect, an unlawful public execution, he stated, underscoring the gravity of the crime. The tragic event unfolded before Martin's family, adding to the emotional toll. Both Martin's wife and stepdaughter were present when he was killed, and their victim impact statements painted a vivid picture of the shock and grief that has since overshadowed their lives. Justice Hall acknowledged the profound weight of their testimony, pointing out how the loss of Martin continues to affect his loved ones deeply. However, Justice Hall also recognized the exceptional level of cooperation the man has offered since his arrest. The former soldier has provided a detailed witness statement and agreed to testify against David Pye, a senior figure within the criminal network. Justice Hall stated that this level of cooperation played a significant role in his sentencing decision. But he also issued a stern warning. If the man fails to uphold his agreement to testify, the current 20-year sentence could be revoked, replaced by a life term with a minimum of 30 years. Under the current terms, the former soldier will serve at least 18 years before he is eligible for parole, offering him a narrow chance at freedom after two decades. Martin's family members, who were present for the sentencing, expressed mixed emotions. Martin's daughter, Tia, voiced her sorrow and frustration as she left the courtroom, describing her father as a great dad. Fighting back tears, she said, He was taken by a bunch of cowards. That's all they are. Cowards. Nothing will ever bring my dad back. Her words echoed the family's enduring grief and sense of injustice. Martin's father also expressed disappointment in the sentence, stating that he would have preferred a longer term. He shared the emotional aftermath of his son's death, saying, We're all still grieving. The loss has left a deep void in the family, underscoring the long-lasting effects of the crime beyond the immediate tragedy. Meanwhile, the man's solicitor, David Manera, indicated that his client was dissatisfied with the sentence and might consider appealing the 20-year term. After speaking with his client, Manera commented on his disappointment with the outcome, suggesting that an appeal may be lodged to seek a further reduction in the sentence. This case continues to shed light on the dark intricacies of organized crime, where violence, loss, and emotional scars extend beyond the individuals directly involved. It also demonstrates the complexities the justice system faces in cases where defendants offer critical cooperation in exchange for lighter sentences. As the case progresses, the unfolding developments will likely raise broader questions about accountability, justice, and the balance between punishment and rehabilitation for those involved in high-stakes criminal networks.